Hello and welcome to Cruise 5. Today our guest is Vera Kantukule. She is the Deputy Minister of Labour. Vera, welcome to Cruise 5. Thank you so much for having me. And I know we're just saying Ministry of Labour, but in Ministry of Labour there are so many things that are going. Of course with the changing names, the ministries keep changing, but there's more than just Labour that you focus on as a ministry. Absolutely. What else do you do? Okay, first off, I think the mandate of the, of the ministry is to develop and protect the labor force in Malawi. Okay. And so when we talk about developing, then it means it's a skills issue. Yes. When we talk about protection, then it's about the compliance issue and the labor standards and all of that. Okay. So there's a lot of things that happen at the ministry. All so right. we used to be called Ministry of Labor skills and innovation yes because we also have an innovation uh, component yes we now that is connected to the job creation agenda okay. youth engagement youth empowerment so there's uh, now we're just uh, developing that uh, sector within the ministry because I think it was dormant for a, for a very long period of time but also I think it was being taken by the Ministry of, uh, of Education so now it has to come back to us and then we are developing it uh, into a fully fledged department We'll get to know more about Vera Haro at the Ministry of Labor, but she is also uh, a lady of many talents, as we're going to discover. But before we get to know the Vera that we see today, let's get back into time and see uh, the little Vera growing up. Uh, how many were you born in your family? We were six. Okay. And you being the... The third one. The third one. Yes. Somewhere mm -hmm. around the middle. Yes, somewhere yes. around the middle. Yeah. Yeah, so we lost one. My brother was murdered uh, in uh, 2016. Oh, so we sorry now, about yeah, that. We are now five. So I think one of the books is talking about that. Your brother was murdered? Yes, he was murdered in uh, South Africa. And uh, because of the um, condition of the body, we had to bury him right there. That's really, really sad. Yeah, it was. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to hear about that. But still, tell me about you growing up as a young kid. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I'm a ghetto kid. I <laughs> <laughs> Which ghetto did you grow up in? Wow. <laughs> She's yeah, a planter girl. Yeah, planter girl. Blah, yes. Zimbabwe, Jirobu, in Naperi. So I think most of my life now, uh, I think the upbringing happened yes. in Naperi, but okay. um, the, the, the early days yes. were in Zimbabwe. That's where my parents were staying. What were so, they doing, your parents? My parents, my father worked for City, so the Blanta City okay, yes, Council. Yes. So yeah. we. Uh, we lived in Wamondon. Ah, I don't right. know if you know Wamondon. It's just <laughs> right behind the market. So that's a real ghetto. <laughs> like you would hear the full noise from the market yes, when you're home absolutely. having uh, dinner. Yeah, and uh, I remember uh, when I was, I think, six yes. or seven, yeah. I would go towards um, Zimwangwa Health Center. Yes. They were giving um, uh, pala, yeah. pala um, this um, fortified porridge yes, to yes, minority yes. children. Yes. It was it usually was at three PM, exactly at three PM. So, so you I'll leave my house at show up. and show up <laughs> and get a, a, a cup of I don't uh, think you porridge. were malnourished though. I wasn't malnourished. But it must have However, been very tasty. It was very, very tasty. And then when my my parents <laughs> discovered that I would uh, sneak out they found out where I was going, and then I told them, if you don't want me to go... <laughs> you should be cooking <laughs> porridge here yeah, every 4 p.m. So now they started cooking porridge. So that's why I still like palalante, <laughs> bagalirolo. That's because fantastic. Of that. That's yeah. fantastic. But some people would say that it's, it must be very tough raising a kid in those areas because there's so much happening in Absolutely. that place. And you really have to be tough if you want to bring up the way you want them to grow up. Yes, because I think after that, my, my, my father lost his job okay. uh, at, at CG and then, no, I think he left or he lost the job, I don't remember, and then we had to move to oh, Gerono when we knew him about Oh my goodness. And then life was a little bit tough, and I think that had a lot of uh, impact on, on, on my upbringing because life there wasn't wasn't as smooth as it was Kumalain. Because at least Kumalain, you know, you and yeah, all of that, but yes, yeah. there, we're living in a place that had at least 11, if it's not 13, house was in one plot yeah. where we had to queue in the morning to use the toilet. Yes. We had to queue in the morning to use the bathroom. Yeah. And then, I mean, it was survival of the fittest. Exactly. And um, yeah, but for me, I think, I don't know, I have a photographic memory, so yeah. I'm, I'm able to remember everything, um, I mean, vividly as though it happened uh, last week. So almost all the things that happened to us as a family, but also me as a kid in the ghetto, I remember. So. At that time, it must have been tough, and I'm sure you never really loved it. But looking back now... I think it didn't really matter. <laughs> it didn't matter. You were just growing up. Yeah. You just had to, to survive. Yeah. But I bet that kind of life prepares you for uh, life uh, ahead. Does. And I think it kind of toughens you up, doesn't it? It does. 
Number one, okay, I think one of the things that I should mention, because I think this is going to come up later yeah. as, as we are discussing, is that because of the toughness of the life that we were living at the time, yes. I created in my mind a life that was, was non-existent. Oh, is that so? Yeah, so I was, I was very, very popular because I taught the best stories. So I had an incredible imagination. And now it shocks me because my daughter, she's now eight years old, she's exactly like me. So I will create a world. You're creating stories. I will create a world of a perfect family <laughs> where my parents are rich, they have a car, they have, we, we don't live in the ghetto. And so when things are tough, I would go to that happy place. Uh, and it, it was so bad, it reached a point where I actually believed that this life actually existed. You see now. Yeah. So, so fact and fiction were exactly. beginning to and merge. And so when I'm, I'm in the hood, I'm talking to my friends, I'll be telling them about their life there, how good it is, and all of that. And, everybody and they're like, wanted. but you're here yes, with us. When did you, you get to live this get, kind of yeah, life? So it was weird, but then, yeah, it was in the mind. And so I wasn't writing then, but I was creating that life for myself, just so that I could escape the life that I was living. So you did your primary school right I there? I did my primary school uh, at Mlamba Primary School. So now, that's the other thing. Yeah. Because my school was like, maybe maybe 10 kilometers from, from where we stay. Because I'm living in Zimwangwa. I'm going to school in Mineri Gushitawira. That's quite so a it's, long it's distance. It's a very, very long distance. That's and you can imagine, distance. they would do from standard one yes. until standard five. So You're having to walk this distance to, to school. And we're walking. There was no, nothing like there was buses. There like no bus. Yeah, and so no, we had to walk no every bars single nothing. day, five days a week, walking and then going to go and sit on the floor and all of that. So that until standard five. And then they, I think six. So something happened mm -hmm. between my parents. Okay. Um, and so I found myself going to two schools at the same time when I was in standard five. They broke up. They had broken up. And so my father wanted me to go live with his sister okay. until he sorted himself out. Yeah. My mother wanted me to be with her because she said, no, I'm alive. Why should my child be raised by somebody else? And so I would go to school to Mlambara Primary School in the morning, uniform me Mlambara. Mm. My dad would come and collect me around break time to take me to Blanta Girls. Oh. And so I would be in Blanta Girls in Southern Five in the uniform me Mlambara. I knock off, I go to my auntie's place. And in the morning, I would wear the uniform, your Blanta girls. I would be in the school, your Blanta girls, in the uniform. My mom would come and collect me at break time and take me to Mlambara. And so at break time, the next day, I would be in another uniform from another school, in, in another school. So it was a little bit... Um, that, that's a bit disorienting for a, a it kid. It was, and young. I think I really didn't do well um, in that class. Yeah. But I think I still passed to the next class, but I, 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 I was really, really disturbed. Vera Kantukula, our guest today on Cruise 5. She is the Deputy Minister of Labor, and she's many other things. If you can see, there are lots of books on the table, and we get to talk about these books a little bit later. But uh, I want us to talk about something even more interesting, and that is music. Okay. Are you a lover of music? Absolutely. What I kind of I music? Sing. <laughs> you sing, right? You sing. So, but yes. she's not singing for us no, today. No, I'm not singing today. Uh, you have not recorded music. Your music, no, have you? No, yeah. I haven't. All right. Yeah, okay. But, maybe with Conte. Maybe. Yes, yes, yes. So, um, so she's obviously a lover of music. She's an artist as well as yeah. as we're beginning to learn. Uh, she can sing, but uh, what song are we going to listen to first on Cruise 5 today? Let's listen to Lorraine Daigo okay. uh, first. All right. Yeah. So first is the title of the, song. the, title of the song. First yeah. is the title of the song and uh, the artist Lorraine Daigo. That's the first song on Cruise 5 today. Welcome back to Cruise 5. Today we're talking to Vera Gantukure. She is the Deputy Minister of Labour and she said she has been to hell and back growing Absolutely. up. <laughs> she has been to hell and back <laughs> yeah. growing up uh, in the um, busy streets of uh, Zingwangwa in Blanta. Uh, parents separating at some point. Yeah. Did they ever get back together? No, they did not. That was it. Yeah. And that was the beginning of your life of going to mom and dad. Yeah, and, yeah. And no, I think, to... I think it was back and forth. So they would get back and then I think eventually, I think when I was nine, that's when they, they, they separated. They permanently for separated. Yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, but then how, what turn did your life take after that? Because uh, from the way the picture you are painting, uh, it looks like all oh, doom and gloom. No, 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 it wasn't doom and gloom. I had everything that I, 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 we needed as a kid. We had foods, uh, food on our table. I think I just didn't have my dad. Oh, yeah. When I needed my dad, and and, and uh, my brother was growing up without a father figure in his life, and also I think I re I remember one of the things that I I remember so well is that no one would take um, an interest to my school report, for example. So I would yeah. go to school, 
maybe I would even go in a, in a dirty uniform. No one yeah. really cared because now I'm at my grandmother's place. So I have all these cousins, all these sisters, all these bigger people around me, but no one is really taking a keen interest in terms of what is really happening with me. And so that's, for me, that's one of the regrets uh, that, I, that I had. So I, I was just growing up in the hood. So you, you were on your own and you were really uh, the architect of your own destiny. Absolutely. That's why this life that I had created was so very much important to me. Because so you were living that life. It was life. giving me sanity <laughs> and, uh, at that point when everything else was not making sense. So we are living in a place that is very close to border stores. Mm -hmm. Every day we are um, seeing uh, fights by time manager Ayufi yes, and yes. Um, the, the, the bar girls yes, uh, yes. across the street. That was their life. And then we can't go to bed if we don't listen to Give Me My Wages, Mr. Foreman. Because you could hear the blasting song. from and the And was already meaning that there's another there's one another coming, one, and yeah, then yeah, that yeah, one is yeah, coming, and yeah. all of that. That was their life. Yeah. And yeah, so I think now growing uh, on the other side, that's when I'm saying, no, that's not a place to raise a child. Yes, but I think exactly. we had no choice. It exactly. was the life, and it shaped us. And uh, you can never take for granted anything else if you have lived that life before. So you do your primary school there and I then secondary school? school. Yes. So um, at, at, um, so they opened another school when I was in Standard 7. Okay. They opened Manja Primary School. So okay. they, I was one of the people that we picked to go to the new school. Okay. And by this time, we have moved to Jirobwe. Right. We are living with my grandparents, my maternal uh, grandparents. So we moved to Jirobwe. Now, I was walking from Jirobwe to Manja Primary School. Goodness I gracious. don't know if you, you know the distance. Yes, yes, I know, it's, it's, I know. It's quite, I think probably double yeah. uh, what I was doing. It's, it's, it's quite a long it distance. Is, yeah, so we were walking every single day to from Jirobwe to, when we were lucky, because so, my, my grandparents had uh, minibuses. Yes. I don't know if you remember, we had Agape minibuses. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, those belong to my to my grandparents. Okay. And so if it's around, I would, I would hope on it. Yeah, but yeah. if it's not, then it meant we are uh, we you had walking. to walk, yeah. Yeah, so um, at Senate 8, then I was selected to go to um, uh, Zimbabwe Secondary School. Okay. I remember my teachers refused me to write the interviews for the Kamuzu uh, Academy. Why? And I, 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 I don't know, but because they said, no, not you. Um, that one was Mrs. Kagwada. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> we she need said, an explanation. <laughs> yeah. There must have been a reason, though. I don't know why uh, she said Because I remember that. in those days, yeah. that's where everybody wanted to go. Everybody wanted to go there. And if you would qualify to yes. just sit for the end. And I did. It was, I did. Quite, it was quite a there part. Was, uh, there was um, Pato Macheso. She's still a friend of mine. Yes. There was Betha Nabuenje. Na, na yeah. I think now she's Mrs. Magomero. Yeah. They were told to go and write. And then said, not you. You're not going to write. You're not going. I was like, I cried the entire week. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I yeah, wasn't yeah. picked. But then eventually I was selected to go to Zimbabwe <laughs> Secondary School. So that's where I did my um, uh, four years. Oh, the four years. At yeah. Form 4, I was disqualified. Uh, the first attempt, that was 1998. What happened? I was disqualified in all science subjects. I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> because I, <laughs> Have you cheated? I, no, I did not. But you remember, I don't know if they did that at your school, yeah. but in, in our school, they did this predicted grades thing. Mm hmm. Do you remember that? When we yes, write yes. the mock exams. The way, when you do the mock exams, yes, yes, then yes, they would yes. do the predicted grades, which yes, they would yes. send to so someone else. So when you performed way above yes. what then you had done, no, no, they'd be no. like, how, how yes. can this So your happen? teachers would say, maybe you get a five here, maybe you get a four here, yes. and, and you then you get a two. If you get a one, they'd be like, there's no way you would have gotten a five. Because even putting you at five, it means ordinarily you must be at six or maybe seven. So I was disqualified in all science subjects, I, I didn't know why. <laughs> and so I had literally no certificate, so I had to go and, re and repeat. So I went to Mesa Williams Girls Secondary School. It was there. Now it's closed. It broke my heart when I Imagine. read Imagine. Yeah, 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 sure. So many schools that, yeah, yeah. that people who are now yeah. uh, working exactly. went to, they, 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 they've left. There's no trace at yeah. all. Yeah, it was uh, the first uh, Assemblies of God uh, mm. secondary school. It used to be a Bible school, mm. and they turned it into a secondary school. But now I think they closed it. Yeah. And I was the only one that passed. At the uh, time, and then I went to to Chancellor College. So, did you do sciences at Chancellor College? Because no, no, no. <laughs> I think you must have heard it. So like, I'm not I, doing sciences uh, anymore. I couldn't do science. This thing I, gets me disqualified. No, I couldn't. I couldn't do science <laughs> at, at Chancellor College. I, actually, we went there uh, the first day to to to. I had no idea what I'm doing, <laughs> and so I go to the where we were collecting the keys to the rooms. Yes. Which program? I said. I, I don't I, know. I know about the <laughs> university. And what, I what do you think I'm I can do? Be here. I read my name on the radio and all of that. And then they found my name and they said Bachelor of Arts. And I was like, what, what is Bachelor of what Arts? What is Bachelor of Arts? Humanities. <laughs> and I, 
you know, we, we went to, to, to do the registration, yes. and I didn't know what I'm supposed to do. Well, that's the story of many people, yeah, I think. Only few people who were doing maybe sciences, maybe science. because we knew, yes. uh, education, yes. because you knew, but then things like social science, we didn't administration, know. We didn't, and, and then we didn't arts. have anyone preparing us. Even when we were going to do the, the what do you call it, the entrance exams, yes. we didn't know. Actually, exactly. I was picked in a program that I didn't uh, sign up for. <laughs> I, 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 I put polytechnic <laughs> yes. in the my second choice was Bunda, yeah, yeah. and then my third choice was... I'm sure they looked at your grades and, and your performance, and they're like, yeah. <laughs> we are <laughs> <laughs> And I'm glad they did. <laughs> exactly, because yeah. uh, it's beginning to show. Yeah, you yeah. are an author, and you say you love to sing as yeah. well. Um, but, so th th that was it, you did arts at, at, at university. Yes, I did. So, however, I, I, I discovered that I was actually very good in social sciences. Okay. And so uh, I, I signed up for the psychology course as yeah. well as the sociology uh, course. But I was very, very good in, in, in uh, psychology. So much so that they were asking me to mark the scripts for first years. When oh, I was is that so? Second year, third yes, year. Yes, yes. At third year, I was earmarked for the lecturer position. So they were training me to become a lecturer. Exactly. In the yes, an associate then, but lecturer. I was an associate lecturer, but then I was an, an arts an, student. An arts student, yeah. So I was encouraged to take a little bit more. So I had more work at yeah. fourth year because I had to pick three more courses to make me a little bit eligible to be a lecturer and so however our results came late yeah. and so when i went for the interviews for the associate lecture they didn't pick me because i was competing with three other people that already had the degrees yes yes and so i thought they thought maybe they should give the chance yeah, to they, the they other people gamble. and then they left me. what if your paper comes and yeah 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 so yeah. i think they didn't want to to gamble with me and okay. then they, they, they picked the other two uh, but i i guess from there still uh it looks like you you your life moved on because you have done quite some commendable work in different fields yes. and you have held quite some senior positions in um, in different organizations. Tell us more about what happened after you left university. After I left university, I didn't get the job, yes. uh, the, the, the associate lecture job that I, I thought I would have because yeah. I thought I'm having it automatically. And yeah, and, and that was a, an easy way it out. It was going to be an really easy way out and, to... I, and I was going to take it for granted because yeah. it was literally given to me on a platter of gold. Yeah. And so I, I would not have really worked hard for it. Yeah. However, something else happened. I think two months down the line, mm -hmm. I got a call um, this woman is telling me, uh, her name is Sikun Koma, uh, that would be my boss. Yeah. She said, um, I was looking for somebody with your credentials and I called the University of Malawi and they gave me Chancellor College Psychology Department who gave me your name. And I was like, wow, wow. they're still remembering they me. Still remember that, was, me. that was yeah, humbling that's, that's, yeah, for that, that's a me. And uh, we used to have Mr. Was it Dino and um, the other guy, but they both died. I yeah. think one of them is the one that uh, gave my name and I was really humbled. I called them and said, what did you do? He said, yeah. no, I think you can do this, so yeah. go. So I went to Lilongwe that time and I remember my grandmother is the one that sent me money to go to to the to to the interviews in in in, in Lilongwe. I was I was really broke. <laughs> it was Four thousand five hundred then for me to get on a coach. So um, I arrive in Area Three at this place and I'm suited up. Yeah. In my graduation suit. Exactly. And that's the only suit. Yeah, that's the only suit I had. That's all that you went yeah. around doing interviews in. Yeah, that's the one I I I wore even at <laughs> at Chancellor <laughs> College for my lecture uh, associate lecture uh, interview, and so they this woman is not interviewing me she was with another woman she just said oh she just starts, starts explaining about this job and then she says do you think you can do it and i was like absolutely yes this is a job interview exactly. ask me questions they wanted someone that had done psychology before and then someone that can work with kids so it was a unicef funded project okay so i needed to mobilize children young people from informal settlements in and then organize them around issues of arts photography and um, I think writing mm -hmm. um, and also it was it, it, it resonated with what I was my, my interest at the time yes and so uh, we, we had to look at the abuses that young people go through in these kind of communities mm -hmm. but they didn't have to speak it they had to do it through photography right, okay. through arts I crafts see. and everything else and so they said do you think you can do it i said absolutely okay. even if i didn't do it i yeah. was gonna google it anyway. yeah yeah sure yeah. this is a job yeah and then the funny thing that happened uh, she asked me uh for my sarah <laughs> and i remember uh, <laughs> i remember pumping myself uh, up uh, yeah, and i said uh, i looked her in the eye and i said you know I'm coming from Chancellor College, <laughs> and so I am not going to accept anything less than twenty-five thousand. <laughs> oh my then, god! Oh my god! And then this woman said, "Excuse me," 
I repeated. Yes. I'm not going to accept anything less than 25,000. She says, but you were at College. You are that cheap? 25,000? 25,000. For me, like, that hey, was... <laughs> 25,000. That's how much this woman uh, offered me. Yeah. 65,000. Yeah, like, like, I was like... You were going to go for a song. You were literally... <laughs> I couldn't believe it. That was my first time. So when can you start? I said, even today. But then you know, I had to go and pick up my stuff oh, in shame. Atlanta. And so yeah, that's oh, how I go. That fantastic. was 2005. Yeah. <laughs> that's our guest today, Vera Kantukule. Um, you are lucky you had a. a, a, a uh, a sincere uh, employer. Yeah. Uh, if I were your employer, I'd say, "Oh, good. Can we go down a bit to twenty thousand? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our next song in Cruise Five today. That should be Casting Crowns. Casting uh, Crowns. Nobody. Nobody. Casting yeah. Crowns. That's a choice of our guest today in Cruise Five, Vera Kantukule, Deputy Minister of Labour. You have done uh, quite a lot for somebody your age, but uh, I think something that comes. Uh, to the fore is the position that you held uh, um, at MASP as CEO, yeah. which I think is the position that you left when you were uh, accepting the uh, ministerial yes. position. Yes. Uh, tell us more about it. All right. Um, I, I don't know if you know that Scotland is not uh, an independent country. It's not yet independent uh, yes, yes. From, 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 Britain. From, from Britain. So yes. that's why it cannot have uh, a defeat uh, in Malawi. So they, 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 it cannot have a Scottish aid okay. in Malawi. Just like UK has a defeat or uh, U, U, USA has a uh, USAID USA, in yes. Malawi. So <clears throat> Malawi School and Partnership was established to create, to, to, uh, to coordinate the civic linkages that exist between uh, the two nations, between okay. Scotland and Malawi. However, our relationship with Scotland dates back to when Dr. David Livingstone first came to Malawi, uh -huh. and that is uh, about 160 years. Uh -huh. I think this year was 160 uh, years. Uh, and so what happens is that the Scottish funding, it does not come directly to Malawi. You have to, so Zodia Broadcasting Corporation, for example, uh -huh. has to be connected to Scottish Broadcasting Corporation. All right. So the money is going to come because uh, our friends, they get money, civil society gets money from the government. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the resources come from the Scottish government yes. to that institution and then to Zodia Broadcasting I Corporation. See. I see. So my job was to ensure that I'm coordinating the linkage between that institution in Scotland and this institution in Malawi. I That's see. number one. But also coordinate the government of Malawi, but also the government of Scotland. Yeah. Coordinate the parliament of Malawi and parliament in Scotland. Why? It's because they don't have eyes here. Mm -hmm. And so my job was to ensure that the money that is being spent on the civil society organizations in Malawi is actually doing what it was meant to do. Uh -huh. That's number one. Number two, even though the money hasn't gone into account, number one, it was still mobilized on behalf of a Malawian. Yes. That is government of Malawi business. That's why my job, my other job, was to ensure that I bring in the government of Malawi to provide policy direction over whatever it is that is happening. So for example, if it's a um, cancer project, in coma. Mm -hmm. As a country, we have our own cancer bl blueprint in terms of what we are focusing. Okay. And so that institution has, has to still ensure that it's following the protocol of government as far as that thing is concerned. Mm -hmm. That was my job. And then if it's, it's, if it's in a particular constituency, my job was to also alert the, the MP of the area, maybe the councillors, and probably link them to their counterparts in Scotland. Mm -hmm. So as I was in Malawi, Malawi-Scotland partnership, there was another sister organization in Scotland called Scotland. Malawi partnership, which I was, see. yeah, like two sides of the same coin. Okay, I see. Yeah. Uh, and um, I understand that the organization grew quite phenomenally when, yeah. you, were, when you were heading it. Tell us about how um, that was able to, uh, to, to, to happen. I think it was pretty much, because I think when I was coming in, it was, it was working in isolation, because mm -hmm. it's still an autonomous institution within the civil society. And so what I found when I had come in was that it was working alone as long as it's implementing programs. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's a network organization, it has about, I think I left about 465 uh, members. And so it was just, okay, we are organizing an AGM, a regional meeting for our members and all of that. But it was not part and parcel of the civil society organizations in Malawi. So what I did was to leverage on my past experience, mm -hmm. the, the connections and networking that I had established. Uh, the networks that I had established in my previous life okay. to ensure that we are making MASP as part and parcel of the, of the civil society organizations. The second task that I had to do was to involve government of Malawi because I had noted that they were not working with government of Malawi, especially at that level. So we needed to lobby. 
so that we get a sufficiently knowledgeable human being within, we were calling them strands. Mm -hmm. Strands would be your thematic area. So yes, we're yes. in health, civic governance, education, uh, agriculture, and all of that. So the ministry, so the, 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 the strand leads, so we're calling them strand leads, the, the personnel from government. Okay. So the, the, the strand lead for health, for example, is supposed to be the principal secretary for, for health. However, because he's a big man, yeah. you would delegate that. However, they would delegate sometimes to maybe an intern okay. who, have been, who has been in the institution for maybe a month. Uh -huh. They cannot come to a meeting. If they come to a meeting, they're just present. They're just but they cannot there. provide policy direction. Mm. They cannot make decisions. They cannot say anything. And so my first task was to ensure that they give us sufficiently knowledgeable human beings to act as strand lead on behalf of the principal secretary. And so I think because of that, I gained the, um, we managed to gain the, 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 the support of the Scottish government and its trust. So much so that Malawi-Scotland partnership is the only institution in the world that is receiving money directly from the Scottish government. Every other institution in Malawi, in Rwanda, in Pakistan, in Zambia, it gets its funding through another uh, partner in Scotland. But MASP alone is the only institution in the world that receives money directly from the Scottish government. That's, that's absolutely impressive. And I, I know that you were also involved, I don't know whether it was in your personal <coughs> capacity or as your capacity as CEO for Malawi Scotland Partnership, but we saw uh, quite a high level of participation in the uh, fresh uh, elections that yes. just happened in, uh, in June 2020. Yes. Uh, tell us more about that, because we saw a report that came out. Yes, absolutely. Um, that was in my personal capacity, because oh, I, I think at, uh, in, in my, I have, even in my contract, I was supposed to be apolitical, because I'm working with the government anyway. Mm -hmm. And so I could not be involved in active politics and being seen to do politics as we know mm -hmm. uh, politics. So I took leave uh, of my work, and so the background to that was that when you look at the previous elections, professionals, we go and vote in the morning and then we go to a bar, relax, and wait for the results to start trickling in. And then we are the first ones that complain over Facebook, social media, and all of that to say, ah, she's some position in the you know. But what exactly did you do to contribute to ensuring that the elections have gone the way they're supposed to go? I and see. so I said, as professionals, in a younger moment, what is it that I have that I, I can contribute? I know a lot. Yes, I'm I know smart. a lot. I read. I can and write, I, I can read, I can do all of these things. And I'm what? leaving that to somebody. And I'm leaving that to somebody. It. And then we're saying, that even my party monitors. Timasi and Tamed, Waona, if you. That they are, these are very, very critical people. But that's a very, very fundamental task to do over an election. Those people are extremely important. So I said, what is it that we can do? What is it that I can do? So I mobilized a group of professionals across Malawi. There were about 350, if not more. And so the funny thing that happened was that a lot of people had promised me that they were going to sponsor me. That was my next question. Yeah. And then they bailed out. All of them. I had five people that had promised me millions. My goodness. And then they bailed out. I was so desperate. And you know what? I'm so glad they didn't give me their money. Mm -hmm. Because I think it, it taught me a lot of lessons that I, I may talk about uh, later, mm -hmm. but, but not now. So I had to, to do some staff to ensure that we at Some least financial gymnastics yeah to ensure that we we we, we took care of our of our observers they had, and we, it happened and it happened they were from chitiba to sanji and it was um it was incredible so we went so we worked like three days non-stop uh from the day of the election i remember being at the place so i was our team we, we were given 10 as a roving uh, observer. So, okay, so the first thing that we did was to apply to the MEC. So to, that's what I was going yeah, yeah, yeah. to say. Were you recognized to the by yes, the election commission? Yes, I was recognized. Actually, even the MEC chair recognized our, our, our contribution towards the elections uh, in, his, in his last speech. Um, and I was very glad he, he did. <laughs> yeah. Because I didn't know he, he knew about but our presence. And yeah. So what we did, I applied to the, to the, to the MEC to say, is it possible for us to, to observe, the, to monitor, because I wanted to be monitor, uh -huh. to monitor the elections. And then they said, because you're not representing any party, you cannot monitor, okay. but you can observe. observe. And then in the absence of the international observers that we didn't have, so we, were, we came in very handy. I see. And so they wrote to me and said, you can bring in your people and then you do. And then they had promised me that they were going to provide training which never happened, because now make was over, you know what happened with this Yes, elections. yes, We're yes. short of resources and also, it was going to be a little bit tricky for us to um, um, 
um, to push to for the training, to push yeah. for the training and expect, and then logistically it was going to be a nightmare because yeah. we had everybody across, across the country. And it so it was either I am a woman go 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 and get training, so mm. wherever you can get it. It was it was it was chaotic, and I got my own and training. This is happening in a very short in a very short of period of time, mm. and then we had to, and then a lot of, and I got bashed, I got vilified because people didn't believe that I could mobilize people without any money. They thought I had gotten money. And, and actually my life was in danger because I got straight, I caused people threatening me th thinking that I'm trying to steal the elections. We know who has sent you, you're trying to steal the elections and whatever. And I'll, it, was, it was very, very tough um, within that, that period. I was nearly stoned to death <laughs> in Ndandi as I went to do my roving observing duties. And also, in, we had a fracas in um, uh, in Mitundu. But uh, I think when you're standing for the truth, these things don't don't really matter. So on the 23rd, we're there. 24th, we're there. 25th, we're there because we had to follow the process until the end. And uh, we did our report. I remember I, I, uh, attending this meeting that was um, after the elections that was sponsored by OSISA, and they were saying, how could you have produced a report in less than 48 hours, and we have sponsored some institutions in your country, and then some of them haven't even given us a report for 2019. And so I said, it's because we really wanted to do this, and we also wanted to show that it's actually very possible for people to governize themselves, come together, and do something for their country. That's Vera Kantukuri, our guest today in Cruise 5. She is the Deputy uh, Minister of Labor. I did warn you that she is many things more than just being a Deputy Minister, and that's what uh, we are learning through this show. Our third song. Our third song should be local, yeah. Faith Musa. Oh, yes. He fights for me. He fights for me yeah. from Faith Musa. That's our next song in Cruise 5 today. This is a little bit difficult to comprehend because a team of young professionals comes together. They are trying to monitor the election and make sure that everything is going according to plan. But somehow people find that to be um, difficult to, 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 to accept. Yeah. And you say they almost marked you. Yes, you they say did. They, Twice. They quite a sin. Yeah. The vice president, um, <laughs> right, one of the was Klaus Chilima had told people during the, 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 the campaign that you need to go and vote and then come back to protect your vote. Ah, yes, and protect I the vote. I think that is, is, it, 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 it enhanced the vigilance that people had. And the scenarios that we had in Ndandile is people actually didn't go home. They voted and they stayed inside, like in, at Kankodola Primary. Yeah. They were right inside Pagrounde Badge and somewhere outside. So they brought in their merchandise. Everybody was outside just packed, And they put like their hook eyes got, on the on, now, the, on the you vote. know there was a lot of rumor mongering. Who wear my marked ballots? We know who wears my marked ballots. And that's what when I arrived at the gate, that's that's what they thought I'm bringing. They Mark saw your ballot. car. They saw and my car. Like, this and then they couldn't see my what my 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 your ID. ID. My ID was inside the court. You know because I had made myself a court that that said my, they had my name on it and then observer at the back. Mm. And so it was inside. And so they, they opened the doors and then I've been taken out uh, by someone. There's Jimwana, Jubwila Jufuna Jipanya wind screen, and then somebody has opened the boot to check for the Mark Ballos and they only found They thought you had brought Mark Ballos. They thought I had brought uh, Mark Ballos. Did you bring Mark Ballos? I didn't bring Mark Ballos, I brought food. And then, You <laughs> and brought Mark food. Yeah, <laughs> brought food. And so, yeah, and then someone recognizes me and says, you know, and then at that point I had a chance to take out my ID. God, this is me. This, this is me. Look at me. Oh okay can do I had a woods one. Then the army guy comes and then gets me and rescues me. And then I leave my car the way it was. Somebody had to come and, and, and close it. And then say no we are say gully mode. That's when I by the time I entered the the headmaster or mistress was even in a room. I would he now some he was being suspected of the Mark 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 Mark. Ooh, yeah. So it was a real, a little bit volatile. It was a very, very tense uh, situation. But I think uh, I think all in all it went well. Is this why the Tonse government awarded you with the position of deputy minister? Absolutely not. In no, recognition no, no. <laughs> of all this um no, hard work that you no, did. No 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 I don't think so. You see, like I said before, we were not standing, we we're not backing a candidate. I think it's very, very important that we should know that we are backing democracy. What we are saying, it doesn't matter who gets it. If Peter Mutariga gets it, he gets it legitimately. If, if, if Dr. Lazarus Yagwira gets it, he gets it legitimately. That's exactly what we had set out to achieve. 
we want to see democracy being upheld. Everything has to go according to plan. We have a responsibility to deliver a credible election. It's not only the responsibility of MEC. As professionals, what is it that we're bringing to the table? Let's do it. And that's exactly what we did. There must be something secretly that you are doing yeah. supporting the current government so that they should recognize you. Secretly, Joe? <laughs> Something clandestine. We, we clandestine. we may never know what it is, but something that something, made them know, we've got one of us somewhere there. Um, I don't know. I, I really cannot say if I was doing something uh, behind the scenes or uh, secretly or Because it can't just happen. I mean, it can't just happen. Like, oh, okay, oh, so we're looking for names. All right, then, <laughs> then I come here and then you're David. I Minister. have been asked this question. The recent one was when I was in Salima for unofficial duties and then this girl walks up to me and says so how did you get here and I'm actually thinking she's asking me how I got did to you Salim drive? and I'm saying I, I, I drove I says no how did you get here here you know then I was like oh mm. you mean that here yeah and job I also don't know I think it's the grace of God that brought me here I really can't pinpoint to something that I did personally that warrants me to have gotten this appointment I, I honest, I'll be lying. So you were genuinely surprised when they I told you that? I was genuinely surprised. I screamed. My kids walked into the place where I was at. I was at the dining room working because that week I was working at home. When I got the call, I was, I screamed and I remember an ambulance came and said, Diani! And I was like, you have absolutely no idea the kind of call that I just got. So, um, I don't, I can't pinpoint to something that I did personally that warrants me. Is it true that you were a vigilant supporter of the Democratic Progressive Party, though? And a cadet. Well, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I was actually expecting that question. Or were you now? Yeah, I was. Uh, I, I thought you. I thought you'd want to bring it up. <laughs> well, I want to know the truth, and I you'd hope that to... what you're going to tell us is nothing but the truth. It's nothing but the truth. What's the truth about it? I'll tell you what the truth is. And um, you see, in life, we we hear and see things. How we interpret what we see and what we hear is based on two things: your position, the physical position when that thing happened or that thing was said. Also, the kind of person that you are. I'll give you a practical example. Mm -hmm. You knew that I was coming mm -hmm. to this show, yes. right? Yes. If you met me at the security barrier there, walking, there are about four explanations as to why I'm walking, mm -hmm. all right? Probably somebody has just dropped me. Okay. Or I had a p tire puncture at ABC and oh. I decided to walk yeah. the rest of the, the, the remaining journey. Mm -hmm. Or I had just come out of a minibus. Yeah. Or I decided to walk. From, from home, home. Yeah. because I like physical fitness, all right? How you interpret my walking to your studio is entirely up to you. Number one, you needed to have been there to see me getting out of the minibus, mm -hmm. all right? Or you needed to have seen me walk from home to decide that probably I've walked from home. Okay. But if you don't have an accurate identification of exactly why this is happening the way it is happening, you can't possibly say. So what are it you is. going to pin this? I am on going the to pin it down. Of proof. Yes. That no, no, no. That's not where I'm going. Okay. I accepted a duty to carry on my shoulder 18 million Malawians, and I don't think it's in their interest that we should sit here and discuss whether I am a cadet or whether I was a DPP supporter or whether I'm a UTM member or whether I'm an MCP member. President Lazarus Chabuera, he said, we are developing and building a new Malawi together with his vice, pre his vice president, Dr. Salos Klaus Chirima. And we are like the midwives because Malawi is pregnant with hope to receive a new baby, a new Malawi. We are the midwives. These two are pregnant with our baby. Our job is to deliver that baby. And so I don't think we should be here discussing whether I was a DPP member or not when we have 100,000 young graduates that are coming out of college every single year, entering the job market that doesn't have jobs. When we have our millions, our thousands of our people working in, under inhuman conditions in factories around the, the, the country, being paid less than the amount of money that you use mm -hmm. for your airtime per week, mm -hmm. we shouldn't be discussing that. So, and so 
I am not going to sit here. I don't think it's in the best interest of Malawians for me to discuss what I was doing before this happened. I don't think it's in the best interest of Malawians. They so, expect me to do a job, to deliver jobs, to ensure that people have skills, to ensure that the labor market has the kind of resources that it should have to provide us with the socioeconomic standing that we want as a nation. Having said all that, are you a supporter of the DPP? No, I am not. You are also an author, I do understand. And I'm looking at books that are laid out in front of me here with your names, with your name written on them. There's the Absalomic Loss, loss yeah. and there is 29 things that destroy good men. Then there is, there are so many books. Yeah. But the book that I wanted us to discuss a little bit in depth is this book. Made to Bloom. Made to Bloom, which I understand got you an international award. Yes. Tell us what's in this book in brief, because I can see it's, it's quite, a, it's quite yeah. a hefty book, about 130 pages or so. Um, I, I usually don't know how to respond to questions. <laughs> <laughs> there were some things that were placed upon my heart for three years, and I kept taking them out, oh, desiring by, desiring by, wanted, because I, I would have audiences where I'm talking about something that is in that book, and I'm thinking, I still don't have the right audience, because I was having this burden within me. All right. And so this is a book that is talking about each person, irrespective of their socioeconomic status, has the opportunity to bloom. Ah. So it doesn't matter whether you're selling mandazi or you're a CEO of some institution. It doesn't matter. The issue is about the impact that you're making where you are planted. And when we talk about blooming, we're talking about you being bloom, blooming where you are, you are planted. For example, if you have um, um, a flower, a rose flower, for example, you plant it here today, tomorrow you take it out, you put it in another place. Tomorrow you take it out, you put it in another place. It's never going to bloom because it's not deeply rooted. But you need to be planted where you really are, where you're supposed to be. And that's how you make impact in your life, in the lives of other people, actually. So that's what Made to Bloom is all about in a nutshell. Inability to celebrate oneself. Yes. So sometimes we don't celebrate ourselves. Yes. We're always looking down on ourselves. It has everything to do with what we call humility. So humility is not thinking uh, uh, any less of yourself. Or if in the lowly da gumbu de ni jovala di so e whatever. No, that's not humility. If it in gabangeja ni ya vera mabanga e if e in gabangeja no, that's not humility. Humility is, is about not focusing on you. It's about focusing on other people. That's what made to bloom is all about. When you are blooming, it means there are other people other than yourself that are benefiting from who you are. And this book won the uh, award in the 2020 edition of the African Authors Awards. Yes, it did. But your first book to win an award, I do believe. Yes. Actually, my, my first ever something to win. I, I've, <laughs> <laughs> I've never won something. Yeah. So it must have been quite a, an astounding achievement to you. Yes, it was. And um, I think, thank God for connections. There's this people that had come to Malawi, they were looking for Malawian authors and they didn't find them. They went to some bookstores and they, they got some, but not all. And then they said, but don't you have female writers? And then someone said, yeah, we have this. And then they got hold of my books. Um, and then they, they read them, they liked them, and then they, they presented them to the awarding committee. They read them, some of them bought online, because they are also, all of them are on Amazon. And so, yeah, so three were actually nominated. Uh, uh, the Professional Woman, Made to Bloom, as well as, um, um, which one? More Than a Pastor's Wife. Fantastic. Yeah, so the Made to Bloom is the one that won. That's our guest today in Cruise 5, uh, Vera Kantukule, Deputy Minister of Labor, but also author the book Made to Bloom. Uh, it's one of the uh, popular books now because they actually, it actually won an award, the 2020 edition of the African Authors Awards. Um, it got that award, quite a, a fantastic achievement there. And I do believe that it's going to lead us to a fantastic choice of song. Uh, yes. Our next song, what is it going to be? Waymaker. Waymaker. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I guess that's... Your life is, is yeah. pretty much about what you say in that song. Absolutely. Sinaj Waymaker, that's our next song in Cruise 5 today. 
You recently launched a club uh, yes. called One Girl at a Time and it's Bloomers. A uh, yeah, it's a project, right? Yeah. Uh, in November, if, if I'm last not mistaken, year, yeah. yes, last year. Tell us more about it. As, okay, so I think one of the things that I discovered. Um, okay, you know Betha Mutali, she's a very good friend of mine. Yes, yes, yes. So, um, she's been doing some writing. Yeah, she's, she's, she's also a fantastic yes, writer. Yes. And so I'm at the, I was traveling somewhere, and then Betha calls me and says, you won't believe what has happened. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what has happened? She says, I have a cousin here, and she had messed up her life and whatever, and then she picked a book, your book, Made to Bloom, and she says, I wish I had read this book when I was in secondary school. Oh. And that just hit me home. I just said, like, yes. we, that's exactly what we must do. We must get this book to every secondary school going kid, girl uh, in Malawi. And so that's how uh, we birthed the, the one girl at a time. Is it working? And, yeah, it's absolutely working. So far, we have distributed over 10,000 copies for free, by the way. Um, to, to girls and seven was across the country. So mm. if it was not for COVID, we should have made uh, a lot of progress. So we have received funding from individuals. FDH Bank gave us uh, some copies as well. And uh, we've been going to other corporates as well to, to get as much funding as we can because it, it, it's, 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 it's going to be very expensive. Uh, design printers print my book at 1,200. But as, um, as a contribution to the initiative, they say they're going to, to print the book at 400. Wow. Yeah. So like, I couldn't believe it myself. So they are printing the book and they did banners for us and, and all of that. So I think it is gaining momentum. And today, coincidentally, that's when we have reached uh, one year since we launched the book. Absolutely. I mean, the initiative at, yes. uh, at Zimbabwe. So let's go. Vera Kantukure, you are the Deputy Minister of Labor. Um, I mean, we, there's a plethora of issues uh, in, in, the, in the labor sector. And we have seen you going around uh, in different places trying to see the conditions of, yeah. uh, of workers and what, what, what have these uh, tours and visits unearthed? All about. Remember, at first I told you the mandate of the ministry, our yes. job is to protect and develop the labor market. So protecting, we have to ensure that we are, we are, we are inspecting and ensuring that member, uh, our, the labor force in Malawi mm -hmm. is working under very good conditions of service. So mm -hmm. we when we are coming into the ministry, we had our work cut out for us, deliver the one million jobs. However, the key thing to note there is we're talking about decent work. So it's just not about you starting a company and then employing people. They have to be paid well, at least observe the minimum wage. They have, if it's a factory, they have to have, they need to have protective gear. They need to have helmets, boots, and all of that. And so it is our job to protect, to ensure that people are adhering to those standards. So we do routine inspections one, um, once in a while. And so last week, uh, from, I think from two weeks ago, we've been doing some of this. And now what we do, these are routine issues that we have to do. It's routine work that we have to do to conduct the inspection. So we have a department of inspection, actually. Uh, but then we have been getting tips also from the general public. So for example, two weeks ago, I went to, um, I had to disguise myself, I went to, uh, KFC, where we had received uh, a, a lot of issues as well, and I spoke to the staff there, and they told me some things that I couldn't believe uh, with my ears uh, at that time. And then last week, I think just Friday, we also went to to Njewa to some of these uh, companies, and it was uh, heartbreaking to see the conditions under which our work, our 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 fellow Malawians are being subjected to. I was looking at the wage book, yeah. and uh, it was written a uh, basic. Uh, salary 5.9 over time 3.1 and that's what someone is getting at the end of the month and these people this is a factory that is making shoes but the people therein are working some of them Dima sleepers Oboga, tattered shirts at the back where I was it was slippery and very very hot they are handling hot things because they're making rubber and all of that with their bare hands. They don't have gloves. They don't have helmets. It was, that's unacceptable. We shouldn't be accepting some of these things in our country. And so we have to do that and then provide the kind of direction that we should have. And maybe even the law backs us up. We can even close some of these uh, places until they comply. But I would expect, as a ministry, that there should be a more systematic approach. You're not going to yes. visit every factory. No, no, no. we country. are not going to visit every factory. Now, the other thing that we are facing now is that there's... Um, our, um, the way our information is being managed, because we have a list of the, of the companies, the DC has another list, the Ministry of Trade has another list, 
the, the, the city assembly has another list. The registrar of companies has another list. So we need to have a coordinated approach to all of this, where at the click of a button we know who is where and where are they, what they are doing and all of that. So it becomes a little bit easier for us even when you do the inspections. But like I say, these are things that we are supposed to be doing on a, on a routine basis as a ministry. The one million jobs. Yeah. That was just a mantra, wasn't no, it? No, absolutely not. It is going to That happen. was just something to make it people is, It is actually that, already right? happening. Because job, what is a job? Define what a job so is. So that's the thing there. That's the thing. And it's I think exactly. it's a mockery to people. No, you no, can't, no. You can't say, we'll give you a million jobs. Yeah. And then we say, oh, no, you, 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 you sweep around the yard. So that's a job. That one job gone. We've got to, uh, no. I, I don't think that's what we're talking about. No, no. When you're talking about jobs, you're talking about economic activities within the system. Those are economic activities. So, for example, we are already creating jobs. The, you, you didn't ask me the other stuff that we do at the ministry. We are trying to, we are creating now, we are in the process of creating what we are calling a labor market information system. This is a system that is going to collect information in terms of what jobs have been created, where, who, are they skilled or non-skilled and all of that. How, how many jobs have been lost within a specified period of time? So, for example, in the first quarter, we need to know how many jobs have been created, where, which sectors, in the private sector, in the government, or maybe MDAs and all of that. We don't have that yet. So we are unable to track. But if you look at even the AIP, the, the aggregation Input Subsidy Program, for example, if you look at the AIP, it has created maybe even millions of jobs, all right? Because you're talking about the multiplier effects of, a, of one project economic activities that are happening within the system that are creating jobs. So for example, if somebody has been given a, a supplier contract, that one is going to employ that one who is going to employ that one who is going to apply that. But if that's, so if, though, that's what we're talking if about. If that's the mathematics we're going to talk yeah. about, there was no need to promise a million jobs at all, because ah. then you, you can just say, well, we will create a, a critical mass of maybe 100 people that will employ many people. No, if you, but if, if you're if, saying a million no, jobs, if you ask me, what you're saying is I'll if, create if, 100, if you, if you 1 you million me, individual jobs. No, if you ask me job, even the 1 million is an, an understatement. We will create. Well, we going, going, going by that definition, yes, definitely it could be. Creating, and I don't think that's what we people creating. were expecting. Because look, okay, maybe people were expecting to be maybe employed in the government. Now, the government system cannot take, the, I think the cutoff point for government should be 200, 250,000. So we're not even, it's just a quarter of the one million that we're talking about. The bulk of the employment that is going to take place, the jobs that are going to be created, is going to be in the private sector. All right? You own a bakery, I think you own like a butchery or something. Then you have four or five boys within that. Those are jobs that are being created. Your issue should be, am I operating a viable entity. Our job as government is to ensure that your business is actually making profit for My you. expectation is yeah. that the government should create jobs that can be properly attributed to them to have created these jobs, not because they yes. provided a conducive environment yeah, yeah, yeah. and somebody said, we have, we, have the, we have the NIF. We have the NIF. And the, I've told you about the AIP. We have so many projects within the government, within ministries that are going to be run. Some of them are already running, that are already creating jobs as we speak. And then we have the NIF. Because, like I said, my ministry is now creating a blueprint for how these jobs are going to be created. A job creation strategy that is going to be launched maybe in a couple of weeks before we close the year. A blueprint. Now, the Ministry of Labor's responsibility is not to actually create the jobs. Our job is to coordinate the creation of the jobs by the other ministries and the MDS. Now, listen, what we have discovered is that the bulk of these jobs are going to be created among SMEs. And so what are we doing? Let's position the NIF the National Economic Empowerment Fund, mm -hmm. to provide support, financial support, to these SMEs, all right, that are going to, so we have about 1.1, 1.2 million SMEs. Can you imagine if we just to take even, maybe just 300 of them, just 300 of those SMEs, provide them with the kind of capacity that they want within their specified sectors. We've, we have created almost a million already jobs, because if each one of them employs one or two, those are like, what? triple that number. So what we're talking about is the creation of a conducive environment for the private sector to thrive, because that's what we, used, we, sh we should be doing. In the past, people were making decisions based on intuition, but now we have to create an environment where people know what they are doing, and they are entering into a, 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 an industry, they are doing business with full knowledge of how things are going to go. They employ people and all of that. However, as a ministry, ourselves is now our challenge would be, how do we collect that data? How many jobs have been created within this specified period of time? For that project that government is running, how many of those jobs have been created? So if Ilovo, for example, I've, I've just given an, an example. 
maybe they should do projections in terms of maybe well, how many jobs are going to be lost and of course sometimes we also have these seasonal uh, jobs that are there so all of that so one million jobs ah, it's doable it is doable it's going to be difficult to account for all the jobs that have been created though because i think well we can just wake up in in march next year with a broad declaration that we have created five million jobs and, and there won't be really much once the labor market information system is up and running we should be able to collect the dead Ministry of Labor and Innovation. Some people would say you can't put innovation and Malawi in the same sentence. It's an oxymoron. Those things, <laughs> they don't, not there's, 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 there's nothing going on in terms of innovation around here. We have been around and the kind of things that we have seen, I'm telling you Malawi is talented. Well, where is it? I, I, I can't see it. There's, there's talented. nothing. We, we are go, importing everything. We are importing everything and that's what is wrong with everything as well. We're importing skills, we're importing yes. products, we're, we're, even importing, we are even exporting we're importing technology, yes. everything. Yes, but it's because maybe for a long time people didn't have a platform through which they could expose or shock us their talents and skills and innovations. Are we going to start getting shot Absolutely. now? Absolutely. Are we? Absolutely. Can we hold you to that? Yes, you can. And you should. You should hold the Tosa government to that because that's what we promised. What should we expect to see? What's the plan? What's going to happen? Because, I mean, I've heard people say, oh, no, I had this kind of innovation, but I don't have the support. Oh, no, I just need lead, I need wire, I need this, I need that, but I, I don't have the money. The government... I've told you, we are positioning the NIF to be the, the platform through which we can build the capacity of these uh, SMEs, all right? And we have institutions like SMED, for example, that looks after the SMEs as well. We have uh, institutions like Mike, for example, that also is into the same thing. So these are the things that probably you didn't even know about, but we have the institutional capacity at the moment already, whose responsibility is to ensure that we build the capacity and we, we increase the, 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 I think the issue is about scale up. We are not short of skills, but we are short of scaling up. And then the other issue that people are looking for is the markets. Once they produce whatever it is that they are producing, mm -hmm. where are they going to sell their merchandise? Yes. That is the key thing. Can you imagine if we could just make maybe two or three decisions to say, from now on, we are no longer importing probably police uniforms. So you're talking about from the cotton farmer all the way to Mapeto wholesalers, all the way to tailors that are trained by Tiveta, all the way to those women that sell buttons and all of that. There's a whole snowballing effect that is going to happen just from one decision. So these are things that are in the pipeline that I'm not at liberty to discuss, but we have a plan that we are going to implement as far as this is concerned. Talking about liberty to do things, as Deputy Minister, you, you don't really have much liberty to do stuff, do you? You're always serving at the pleasure of the minister and... Uh... I don't no. know. Don't, don't no. you get that feeling sometimes? Like, Ma, no, I think no, no. I, I, I'm just I, I here not. warming this seat. No, no, no. Warm your seat. But listen, I am deputizing an incredible man. I am working with uh, uh, Honorable uh, Ken Kandodo, an incredible human being. He's teaching me a lot of things. And one of the key things that that man is teaching me is to balance between me being the professional and then um, the politics side of things as far as our job is concerned. All right? Now, we do our work together. Sometimes he delegates stuff to me. Sometimes, we, like even the, the, the thing that we did last Friday, he went another way, I went another way. But I think I was criticized to say, and all of that. So I think I cannot say that I'm serving at the pleasure of him. I think I can say that we're working together as a team. So now, welcome to politics. Yes. You're right. At the heart of it, you can't be working as a deputy minister and say, oh, no, I am apolitical and what, what, you, yeah. you must be. So what, what are the new things you are learning? Because, I mean, you have been critical yes. uh, of politicians before, <laughs> politicians, yes. and painting them with one huge brush. And now yes. you're there, you're like, mm -mm, I think I might have rushed to make that uh, criticism. Not really. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Some of those things I see hold them very Yeah, little, yeah. yeah. What, are, what things are you learning uh, working closely with... Uh, you know, I politicians. think one of one of the things that I have I have learned uh, over the, the space of the six months is that um, where your heart is is what really matters. Why are we are you doing what you're doing? Mm -hmm. Proverbs sixteen verse two, the Bible says, "Many are the plans of man, but God judges the motive." Mm -hmm. The motive of you doing everything that you are supposed to be doing. What is fueling your decisions? What is fueling your choices? That's what separates winners from those that lose. And so that's one of the critical things that I've learned. Kuti, in politics, 
really. It should be about something that is bigger than yourself. Mm -hmm. Focus on that thing. And what is that? The people. So if you're going to be there and you're saying, ah, you know what, we're going to use this as to get to there and whatever, you are going to come crashing down. If you're climbing up the mountain that people should see you, they will see you, all right? But you will come crashing down. But if you're coming, climbing up the mountain to say, I want to see what are the gaps and how I fit into those gaps, you are going to come back a champion. That's what I'm saying. That's one of the most fundamental uh, issues that I've learned so far. Some, some would say being a minister, it's a one-way street and that uh, you are slowly becoming someone who is unemployable yeah. uh, because after you, uh, after this maybe you might hope to be uh, a full minister or something like that. But um, when it no longer pleases the appointing authority and yeah. then you're no longer minister, um, do you still see your life moving on after that? Because... Um, Examples are many, too numerous to mention, yes. of people who have uh, ended their, their <clears throat> career and their life just like that. I'm 38 years old, and I've been, I haven't been a minister all my life. I've just been a, a, a deputy minister for the past six months. Mm -hmm. I should be able to live another 38 years, 45 years without being a minister. Okay. Right? However, I will tell you this. It is what I do with this opportunity that I've been given that is going to separate me from the others that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. That's number one. The second thing is, I accepted a call of national duty to carry over my shoulders the burden of 18 million Malawians and Joab. I will give it my best shot, giving the best parts of me that make me who I really am to deliver the task that is at hand. And when the curtain is drawn on me, I'll go out a happy person. So it doesn't really matter. If a senior government official, let's say a, a cabinet minister, is convicted of wrongdoing, yeah. would you think they should resign? Convicted? Yes. By the time, we, I mean, if the process has taken place, you cannot get to a conviction when there have not been any arrest and all of that. Then mm -hmm. already, already that, pre that person is supposed to be out by that time the conviction is being, is being, is being taken, is being made, that decision of convicting them is being taken then they should have been arrested, gone to court, and all of that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they should resign. If there are strong allegations that a senior government official is involved in some wrongdoing, yeah. would you say they should resign? No. Remember, there's a lot of issues that are happening around. A lot of rumors that are being thrown here and there and all of that. And um, I don't think it is wise for anybody to make decisions based on those things unless it has been proven that at least uh, that a wrongdoing or a wrong was done mm -hmm. all right and so what if you just can't say oh they are saying that I've done this and then I'm resigning no I don't think I don't think that's right and so but if you've lost the trust of the people if you've lost the trust of the people it, it for me I think it's what is the bigger picture mm -hmm. what is the bigger picture who are you accountable to? All right. Why are these things happening? Remember I told you, I don't know if you remember this because you were so inclined towards asking me something else. I have told you that how you interpret what you hear no, I heard is a matter of who you really are. I and heard, so I why that. should somebody, because there's just been a rumor and then you expect somebody to resign? I don't think that's fair. We have to wind up this chat uh, much as I would love uh, for us to talk a bit more. Uh, but uh, before we wind up, I've got a set of questions which I'd like to ask you. Okay. To which you can only answer yes or no. Okay. Are you ready to do this with me? Yes. First, though, you have to tell me your full name. I am Vera Kantukule. Do you have any tattoos? No. Do you ever want to be president of Malawi? Uh, no. Do you have any piercings? Yes. Do you have children? Yes. Have you ever shot a gun? No. Have you cried over someone? Yes. Have you fallen in love before? Yes. Have you killed a chicken before? No. Have you killed a goat before? No. Have you gotten into a fight before? Yes. Have you gotten any surgeries? Yes. Have you ever been hospitalized? Yes. Have you donated blood? No. Have you smoked weed? No. Would you smoke weed? No. Have you ever drunk alcohol? Yes. Do you drink alcohol? No. Have you broken someone's heart? I think so. <laughs> Have you had a crush on someone? Yes. Oh, that was an emphatic yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
It's the truth. <laughs> yes, it is the truth. And we end it there. No more questions asked. All right. uh, but um, I, 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 I never asked you if you're married and if you have yes, children. You yes, are married. I'm and married children? to Edson. I have two children. One is 10, one is 8. And that's about it, or uh, we should expect... No, uh, that's about it. That's about it. Yeah. Two children. Yes, two children. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Thank Vera. Thank you so much. And I wish you all me. the best. Thank you so we much. We still have to select our last song. What is it going to be? It's going to be He's Able by uh, Dietrich Haddon. And I noted that your choice of songs, most of them are Christian songs. Yes. I take it you are a Christian? Yes, I like worship songs, and um, I think we're nothing without God. Are you quite vibrant in, uh, in your church? Absolutely. I'm a deaconess. Oh, you are a yes, deaconess yes. of what church? PC and Presbyterian Church of Malawi. I see. So we've been yeah. speaking to a, a deaconess <laughs> uh, of a PCM, and the last song is going to be He Is Able, the last choice of our guest today, Vera Kantuku, Deputy Minister of Labor. Until next time, it's goodbye.